And good morning. It is time once again for Basic Chemical Principles, Blyle's Basic Chemical Principles, which I always throw on there because I don't want to violate anybody's name, copyright, or whatever it is. Uh, let's see. Let's start off with going around the room and having everybody introduce themselves. Good. All right. Uh, lonely, lonely, lonely day today. I had one student uh, here yesterday. Uh, she has informed me that she cannot attend today. So uh, this is just Blyle talking to himself, which is, you know, always fun. Um, I guess it's really no different than I, when I stand in front of a class of 50 students who are not responding. It's you know, the same thing. You know, you're paying for the class. You should ask questions. You should, you know, interact. Not to the point of being a nuisance, but, you know. Anyway, uh, we're going to go ahead and get jump right into it today. We're going to pick up where we left off yesterday. Uh, if I can get my... That's not going to work. So let me get my screen sharing working once again. Um, like I say, I am using the remarkable two for notes uh, because that way I also have, can create a PDF file of whatever it is that I do. Uh, I noticed yesterday it was kind of hard. I work kind of small when I do this, uh, which makes it kind of hard to see. But of course, I was also on something this big. Uh, so if you're on a bigger, if you're having trouble, try a bigger screen. Uh, you can always zoom in, I think. I hope you can zoom in. Uh, I'm honestly not sure if you can or not. Um, but the Remarkable 2, you know, it doesn't have color like Zoom Whiteboard has, but it's also more responsive. Um, so I, I can actually write better on the Remarkable 2 than I can on the screen. Anyway, today we're going to talk about scientific method, something that I realized the book doesn't cover, which I think is very odd. Uh, and it's kind of important to cover it. What is the scientific method? We're going to talk about properties just because we touched on it yesterday, but uh, yesterday, Tuesday, but didn't really go into it. We're going to jump into math. This, today is going to be a math heavy course. And, uh, okay. Contain your excitement. I know everyone is looking forward to that. We're going to talk about scientific notation and significant figures because, like I said, I'm not assuming you know anything. I'm, I'm not assuming you have a background that has already covered scientific notation and sig figs. Uh, and then we're going to talk about a basic problem-solving approach. It's not just for chemistry, but it can be used in other courses as well. It's called the factor label method, or sometimes it's called unit analysis. It's gone through different name changes throughout the years. For those of you who remember me, this is my addiction, Diet Coke. Um, at this point, it really is an addiction. It's not like a favorite drink of mine, but it's one I drink very frequently. Um, but if I try to stop now, I get withdrawal symptoms. So I'm trying to cut back. Uh, my students who remember me will remember I would go through 10, 12, 15 of those in a day trying to cut back. So now I use them to count. So I'm reusing the bottles. Every time I finish a Diet Coke, uh, my goal is to refill the bottle twice um, and cut back on uh, on the amount of Diet Coke that I drink. And it also increases the uh, total amount of vodka that I get into my system. Okay. That's a joke. It's like a joke. It's just smaller. I said last time that science, all sciences are experience-based. Um, and they all use the scientific method. Now, I think a lot of people assume that the scientific method um, is only for science. It's really not. The scientific method is honestly an approach to solving questions. Um, you can use it anywhere. But science, of course, relate, relay, uh, relies on it. So what is the scientific method? Depending on the textbook, 
And depending on your teacher, there are a series of steps for the scientific method that may or may not vary, but they're all basically the same. They all have the same basic concept. The scientific method always begins with an observation. It begins with something you notice. Um, you do not start the scientific method without something striking your, per your, your curiosity, without something making you wonder. Um, and that's the start of the scientific method. It can be anything. I used to do a, uh, an experiment uh, in one of my classes where I would tell students about something that I saw in a store once called chocolate covered bacon. That became the observation. That is, it's something that I've noticed. Uh, chocolate covered bacon. It's a real thing. It's actually out there. Uh, actually, if you make your own, it is so much cheaper. Uh, if you buy it in a store, um, I've seen it available for $5 for basically half a strip of bacon uh, dipped in chocolate. You can make your own. It's just, it's wonderful. It's marvelous. Anyway, no, I'm not going to say that because that's the observation, just the fact that it exists. So once you notice something, the next step in the, in the scientific method, and this is critical, you formulate a question. The scientific method is all about answering questions. So now we have scientific, okay, now we have an observation, chocolate bacon exists. And we formulate a question, the most obvious question if you've never tried it, Gee, I wonder if I would like that. The best questions are simple and straightforward. Um, do objects fall at the same rate? Um, is, is a question. It's, it's something straightforward, it's simple. Um, don't try to get all fancy with it. You know, it doesn't, you don't have to, you know, when you publish a paper, I suppose you should try to get a little more technical, but there's no reason to try to formulate a question using terminology that is complex. Ask a question. What do you want to know about it? Before launching into some kind of a research project, though, the next obvious question is, has somebody already answered this? So the next step in the scientific method is always to do research, usually a library search. It used to be in my day, it was a library search. But you do some sort of a, uh, a search. These days, you use a search engine like Google. You just look it up. Um, if you can find the answer, you're done. That's it. Um, the best questions you can, of course, if you're asking, will I like chocolate bacon? You're not going to find that on a Google search. Um, there is a misnomer out there that uh, you can find anything on Google. Everything is available on the web. Um, I don't think that's true. People discover things that they don't put on the web. Uh, but what's more, we don't know everything. So don't be surprised if a Google search does not come up with the answer that you're looking for. Uh, will I like chocolate covered, chocolate dipped bacon? Well, I'm not going to find that on Google because it's a very personal kind of a thing. What I might find are reviews on what they taste like and whatnot. When you do a library search, especially if it's Google, you must, you must, you must always remember to use appropriate resources. Uh, you cannot fall for the nonsense that is out there. So if you're going to do a Google search, make sure 
It is a recognized source In other words, is it well known to be unbiased or at least minimally biased? There's, it's, it's impossible to have something to have news that's unbiased because news is written by humans and humans naturally have a bias. But there's a distinct difference between a reporter trying to report the facts which can also be, by the way, bias. I mean, just the simple facts alone. Uh, for example, a headline that says, uh, Ukraine defends against Russian aggression um, is, is biased towards the Ukraine. Uh, Russian invades the Ukraine to rec reclaim lost land, uh, lost land or you know something like that is pro-russian it's the same thing russia is invading the ukraine but even the headline alone has uh, an inherent bias built into it so always recognize that anything you read it's going to be biased um but also avoid any kind of opinion because that is excessively biased um The Ukraine is invaded by Russia in an unprovoked attack that never should have happened. That is filled with bias. Uh, and the bias goes both ways. So do be a little careful. Recognize the source. Um, don't believe everything you read. Remember, everything has bias to it. But But some news sources have been proven uh, to just flat out lie. There's a major news source out there that I'm not going to mention the name, but they have been demonstrated time and time again that they propagate lies. And recently, in fact, it's been demonstrated that their internal, their, their, their messaging um, outside of the news is completely contradictory to what they are reporting to the American people. This is a famously biased news source. Other news sources um, will lean, but I would rather read a news source that leans left or leans right than a news source that is just flamingly misleading. Uh, so choose your sources carefully. All, when you're looking up sci something scientific, see if it's a recognized you know, scientific source, um, Scientific American is usually a pretty reliable source for scientific news. Uh, is it a government source, the cdc.gov? And I know there's been a lot of attacks on the CDC in the past few years, but the CDC, their goal is to protect the American people. It is a recognized government site. They work hard to present, prevent, the, uh, prevent to present the facts. Um, so, you know, what's the source? What are you looking at? Um, the American Chemical Society, good source of news for chemistry news. Um, Fred's Scientific Advances. I've never heard of Fred before. What, the, what is that? So if I read something on Fred's Scientific Advances that, that strikes my fancy, I'm not going to believe it. Uh, the other day, a friend of mine posted on my social media post about uh, a particular, I guess it's supposed to be a catalyst that uh, simply releases hydrogen from water. Free and clear, just releases hydrogen. There it is. Yay, a source of hydrogen uh, that is uh, um, uh, free. It's a great source of clean fuel and it reacts. It just gives water back. Of course, it's wonderful news. It's also complete nonsense. It, it uh, violates the rules of chemistry it violates thermodynamics laws. Uh, and if you read it really, really carefully, you'll see that there's one little line in there, very small line that says, and it's easily regenerated. That's where the energy input comes from. 
So it's not just a free release of hydrogen. You're inputting energy to make that thing work. Uh, and that energy, the energy you put in, according to the laws of thermodynamics, will be at least as much energy as you can get out from the hydrogen. And based on the second law of thermodynamics, it'll actually cost more. I have an electric, actually, it's a hybrid vehicle that I keep plugged into my house. Woohoo! Free transportation. No, no emissions at all. Well, that's wrong. Because all I've done is I've shifted the power from an internal gas combustion to an external power grid. Now, that power grid is clean energy, and that's uh, solar power, wind power. Then it's, it's green. But in my state, we do not have a significant amount of clean energy, which is just tragic, in my opinion. We still rely very much on fossil fuels, coal, oil, to generate electricity. So when I charge up my car, I am producing just as much and probably more greenhouse gases than if it was an internal combustion engine. There's no such thing as free energy. So be a little careful when you read these sources. That source that my friend posted, it was designed to get readers. The advertisers who pay for that, for that uh, article, uh, they all pay for every click that, that comes on. Uh, my, I, I do a blog. Uh, and every time someone clicks one of, my, one of my writings, I get credit for it. Now, I don't get nearly as much credit as they do. I have maybe 15 clicks a day, which is almost nothing at all. I did a calculation. I should get 100 bucks in literally 25 years. woo -hoo! I can buy lunch. Um, but articles like that that are going to get hundreds of thousands, if not millions of clicks, they're going to make money off of that. And that's the reason it's written the way that it's written. So recognize the source. If you don't recognize the source, if you are really interested in that article in generating hydrogen, go and find a legitimate science source and double check it. Is it in Scientific American? Is it, is it you know, um, look on the website and see what it says. Is there a, a uh, Google actually has a scholarly search engine, which is kind of cool. Look it up in the scholarly search, search, see if you can find it. So don't be fooled by a lot of false information that's out there that's designed to get you to click uh, or mislead you. Uh, when I look up chocolate covered bacon, there are going to be two kinds of reviews that I find. If the review that I find is a source that is trying to sell chocolate covered bacon, guess what? They're going to say it's the best thing since, since toilet paper. If they're trying to sell you chocolate covered bacon, they're going to tell you that you may be an atheist, but you won't be after you try our chocolate covered bacon. It's excessively biased. A food network source would be less biased. If, if you're looking up something like Food Network, we're gonna do a legitimate review. Oh, look, here's a combination of sweet and salty, which is one of our favorite things. Again, a little bias there, but, uh, but they're gonna talk about, you know, well, it's sweet and it's salty. A lot of people like it. Some people have struggle with, with the taste of chocolate uh, on their bacon, but uh, most people seem to like it. So make sure it's a recognized source. Um, and always think for yourself, does this really make sense? Could this be real? Um, always double guess, double check, double. Always think about what you're reading. Does it really make sense? Is it possible that we're going to now get free energy by throwing this it was actually an alloy into water. Is that possible? Can we get free energy? According to thermodynamics, we can't. We want to talk a little bit about that too. It's much further down the line. If you cannot find something that answers your question exactly, 
The next step is to formulate a hypothesis. A hypothesis is just a guess. It's what you think you're going to find. It's what you think the truth might be. Um, a lot of people confuse hypothesis with theory, um, which is kind of sad. Um, hypothesis is just an educated guess. How to get educated? From the library search. Now that you've done a library search on chocolate covered bacon, how many people like it? Um, think about the sweet and salty flavor. Do you like sweet and salty? Sweet and salty. Sweet and salty. Like they, uh, do you like sweet and salty? Do you like sea salt caramel? Uh, that might give you an idea on if you will like it or not. Once you formulate a hypothesis, then you do experimentation. The experiments that you do are, des are designed to test your hypothesis. That's the key. Um, if you're trying to figure out if you like chocolate covered bacon and then you go to see if plastic floats, that's not related. That's not the experiment you want to do. Um, the most obvious experiment for chocolate covered bacon, you get some chocolate covered bacon, you make it yourself. Uh, or you uh, um, go out and buy it. Uh, it's, it's available at like international stores. And you try it. You do the experiment. Once you have done the experiment, then you, what's the word I'm looking for? You, 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 you evaluate your hypothesis. Was it right or was it wrong? You evaluate your hypothesis. Does it make sense? Does it not make sense? Now, here's the key. After you evaluate your hypothesis, you modify the experiment. And you do a different experiment. Meh. Chocolate covered bacon was okay. I used milk chocolate. I wonder if it would be better with semi-sweet chocolate. Maybe I like it with dark chocolate. Maybe I like it with Belgian chocolate instead of American chocolate. Uh, so you modify the experiment. This is where the loop of science comes from. And I want you to notice, as you do this eventually, you do as many experiments as you can, Eventually, you either have to reject your hypothesis or accept your hypothesis as correct. Um, actually, I kind of. You accept your hypothesis as correct. You reject your hypothesis as completely wrong. That's not a failure. If your hypothesis is wrong, that is not a failure. That's part of the scientific method. The scientific method is self-correcting. That's very important, and that's why it is accepted by so many people. Um, you accept, you reject, or you modify Your hypothesis can be modified. Um, I will like chocolate covered bacon. Well, kind of yes, kind of no. Oh, here it is in dark chocolate. Oh, I love it in dark chocolate. Now I have a modified hypothesis. I love chocolate covered bacon in dark chocolate. Now it's a modified hypothesis. And you test that with a couple different brands, different levels of, of uh, chocolate, cacao uh, content. So you keep experimenting now with your modified experiment. 
if you reject your hypothesis, um, well, actually, if you accept or reject, the final step is to report your findings. Report your findings, very important step in the scientific method. You must report your findings because we want other scientists to be able to test your hypothesis. Um, these are the basic steps of the scientific method. We're going to go, actually, we're, we're about to talk a little more about uh, hypothesis versus theory versus law. Um, but these are the basic steps of the scientific method. Report your findings. Um, chemists, scientists, not just chemists, scientists will do this in scientific journals. Um, reporting your findings allows other scientists to evaluate what you've done and further experiment. Um, obviously, if you're gonna report on chocolate covered bacon, you can add a comment to the articles that you have read. You know, a lot of these articles allow comments, but um, some years ago, Pons and Fleischmann um, hypothesized that they can create fusion at room temperature. It's called cold fusion. It's a chemical, it's a nuclear reaction, not a chemical reaction, a nuclear reaction. They made a mistake. They went public. They reported their findings to the general news and people got so excited about it. And other scientists were saying, eh, wait a minute. Had they reported their findings in scientific journals, other scientists would have tried to repeat the experiment. And when they could not repeat the experiment, they would begin to formulate hypotheses on what Pons, Pons and Fleischmann were actually measuring. For example, Pons and Fleischmann reported a radiation output that they measured. Turns out that radiation output was a low level radiation source in their lab. It was a mistake. In a scientific journal, if they report that, it sort of stays within the scientific community. Once it's been repeated a few times, then it'll become picked up by the general news and it'll generate a lot of excitement. But the problem is reporting it to the general news first generated a lot of excitement and then follow-up articles saying, oh, no, this was wrong, which generates a lot of questions from the general public. Well, you're a scientist, how could you be so dumb? Well, they're not dumb. In fact, they were very well-respected scientists and brilliant electrochemists at that. They made a mistake. And the shame that they started getting from the general public, not from within their community, but from the general public, drove them out of science. Uh, one of them has left sci the science field altogether, no longer is active. The other one actually moved overseas and is working somewhere in Europe, my, is my understanding. Probably doing very well. Because like I say, these guys were very bright. They were very good. They just made a mistake. So that kind of brings us to the next step of the scientific method. So now you have a published hypothesis. You do not publish a hypothesis unless you believe it is correct unless you believe it's true. Now you have, and notice, now you have a set of observations. Pons and Fleischmann uh, seem to be generating um, radiation output from their reaction. They thought they did. Um, seem to be getting more energy out of it than they were putting into it, which by the way, um, seems to be true. We're still not quite sure what was going on in their experiment. Most American scientists discarded it completely. That was a mistake. Uh, that 
process that, that they had reported is, well, I don't know if it still is today, but as, as recently as, as 2000, still heavily researched in Japan, trying to figure out just what's really going on. So a hypothesis, got a little hair. So a hypothesis, you publish it because you believe it's true. But in order for a scientific model, and, and that hypothesis, all it does, it's a guess that encompasses the available information. It's a guess that, and we talked about this last time, it's just a guess that encompasses the available data. That's all it is. But in order for a hypothesis to be accepted by the scientific community, it must be reproducible. Let me spell reproducible correctly now. Why is my eraser not working? There we go. Oh, for crying out loud. Not sure if it's I B L E or A B L E. That, that may still be misspelled. I don't know. Uh, anyway, my hypothesis is that it's spelled with an I. Must be reproducible. Reproducible by whom? Yourself? No, of course not. You're the one who has already reproduced the data. It has to be reproduced by other people in other labs. Everywhere. We are still stuck on this planet for the most part. Very few people have escaped gravity. So if that hypothesis has to be reproduced by scientists literally around the world, and if we ever make it into space on every other planet in the universe, it must be reproducible. Not just the experiment that you did, but new experiments. Everybody who reads a hypothesis, here's cold fusion, they can come up with their own experiments. They're gonna come up with, with experiments you did not think about. And that hypothesis has to fit all of those new experiments as well. If not, the hypothesis will be modified or rejected. There are some hypotheses that just flat out get rejected. Um, back in the 70s, if I'm not mistaken, uh, somebody came up with a set of observations that made them believe that water could polymerize, called polywater. Um, seemed to do so, especially at high altitudes. Well, they tried to reproduce it and simply could not. It was simply impossible to reproduce. Uh, it's now believed that what they were seeing were surface effects. The, the original people were doing experiments in capillary tubes. Well, capillary tubes have a lot of surface area, so the interaction of the water with the surface was causing some unusual behavior. Um, but it could be explained with that surface tension, with surface interactions, things of that nature. Uh, so a new hypothesis was formed saying, no, this is just surface tension, and here's why. And it fit not only the new experiments, but it went back and fit the original experiment as well. But all of that data, even if a hypothesis is rejected, the data generated by those experiments, is still out there. It's still valid. Uh, so it has to be explained. So for a hypothesis, it has to be reproducible. Uh, if it is reproducible often enough, We are talking about over many, many years, it becomes a theory. That's the difference between a theory and a hypothesis. A hypothesis is fairly new. Um, this is where, and I may irritate some people saying this, but this is where things like holistic medicine breaks down. Holistic medicine has a lot of anecdotal evidence. Here, take this essential oil to cure the common cold. And your common cold will clear up in nine days. Well, the common cold usually clears up in about nine days, even without treatment. So is the essential oil really doing anything? 
people will report, oh, it makes me feel a lot better. Well, yes, that could also be in your own mind. I'm not discounting the possibility of holistic medicine. In fact, there are some medicines out there that do work. The Native Americans used to chew on bark when they had headaches. Uh, turns out what they were actually chewing on was a natural source of aspirin. And eventually scientists isolated aspirin and learned how to synthesize it. And that's what we take for today. Guess what? A holistic approach that works. So yeah, sometimes the holistic approaches work, but if it's not reproducible, that's where holistic medicine suddenly becomes uh, questionable. You know, it, it worked for, for Tom over there. It's not doing anything for me. So if it's not reproducible, it's a hypothesis. It's, it's in fact, I'm gonna reject that hypothesis. Uh, depending on, you know, like I say, there are some things that, that absolutely work. But it has to be reproducible by everybody in order to become a hypothesis. Uh, medicines are a little weird because what they'll do is they'll say, well, look, uh, it works more frequently than not. So 78% of the time people will recover. Does it work for everybody? Well, no, but that 78% is probably reproducible. And that's the important part. Um, so if it is frequently tested and accepted over and over and over, over years and years and years, it becomes a theory. Uh, quantum mechanics is now quantum theory. It's not quantum law. It's a theory because it has been reproduced in a variety of ways. And people are beginning to believe that it is true. If it is a theory for an extended period of time, it becomes a law. The scientific law. Even laws can be proven wrong. This is something that a lot of people don't really understand. Um, even laws have a built-in possibility of being disproven. People test, people retest laws all the time. Um, So this is where we started talking yesterday about how there's no truth in science. There's observations and there's the best, the models that best fit those observations. One of the most important laws in science is the law of conservation of energy. Energy, you can never have energy from nothing. You cannot create more energy than you put into a system. It's the law of conservation of energy. And energy that is expended always goes somewhere. Even after you use it for work, it becomes heat. It becomes dissipated into the universe. It's neither created nor destroyed. Is that absolute truth? No. We accept it as nearly absolute truth, but we also understand that tomorrow somebody could come along and prove it's completely wrong. So how do we know it's right? We don't. And here's something that, that may blow your mind. The only reason we accept it as truth is because nobody has been able to disprove it. That's all. Our most fundamental laws in science are laws because they've never been disproven. In science, we can disprove theories. We can disprove laws. We can disprove hypotheses. We cannot prove. Even today, NASA is photographing the Earth to prove it is actually a sphere. Is it? We assume it is. There's been so much, and that's the thing. There's so much data now that says, yes, the Earth is round, not flat. Sorry, flat Earthers. That's where, and we've proven the Earth is not flat. But it's impossible to prove that it's actually round. The more data we collect, the less likely that it is not round. So we can accept that as, as a scientific law, the Earth is round. 
Uh, there are actually geological uh, reasons for this, ge geometrical uh, arguments for this as well. But will we ever disprove it? Probably not. That's why we accept it. But who knows what the future will bring. All right, regular class, I would give a 20 minute break. I'm sorry, a five minute break and I deserve a five minute break. So what I'm gonna do here, I'm gonna take a break. Um, I will be back in five minutes. If you are watching live, you are not. So doesn't matter. See you in a bit. And we are back. Seemed like a really short break to you, didn't it? See, and I refilled my water bottle. I already drank a little bit. Uh, I'm sorry, a uh, uh, vodka bottle. Um, vodka, or is it wrong? I don't know. I, don't, I actually don't drink, believe it or not. Uh, not that I'm an alcoholic, and there's nothing wrong with alcoholism. Uh, recovering alcoholics, my heart goes out to you, because I know that's, that's not an easy thing, but... I never liked the taste of alcohol. I never liked the effects of alcohol. So I just don't drink. Anyway, let's not turn this into a political you know, debate. Uh, but anyway, by, by drinking two of these, I know that I have twice the water intake than, uh, than, than my, my pop. Standing in a deli in New York City, the refrigerator was near the door. I was getting a sandwich and I said, oh, and charge me for a can of pop. I'll just pick it up on the way out. And this woman standing next to me put her hand on her hip and looked at me and said, it's a soda. Looked her dead in the eye and I said, no, it's a carbonated beverage. Crying out loud. The things people argue about, I don't get it. It's crazy. Anyway... If you took a bathroom break, I hope everything came out okay. So, let's talk a little bit about properties and then we're going to launch into, into some math. There are two kinds of properties that we talk about. Actually, there are a lot of different types, but the two that the book talks about, intensive and extensive. Intensive properties do not depend on amount. They're independent. Independent of qual quantity. Um, the color of something doesn't matter how much there is, it's the same color. Um, it may look like there's, if you don't have enough of it, it may be hard to tell what the color is, but it's still the same color. Um, hardness, doesn't matter how much you have, it's the same hardness. Now you can have it in different forms. Uh, if you powder it up, it's going to feel like it's a different hardness, but it's really not, it's just that the, the, whatever it is is slipping around each other. Uh, density, we're gonna talk a little bit about density probably today. Doesn't matter how much you have, the density does not change. Uh, they're intensive properties, independent of how much you have, independent of quantity. Therefore, extensive properties depend on quantity. So, mass is an extensive property. How many grams of gold is that weighing? It's an extensive property. The more gold you have, the higher the mass. Uh, the volume is extensive. The volume of water in this container, uh, it was, when it was up here, 500 milliliters. I've drunk some of it. So now it's less than 500. That's an extensive property. It depends on how much you have. 
Okay, I would ask if there are any questions about that, but if anyone answers, I would scare myself. So we did scientific method, we did properties. Let's talk a little bit about scientific notation and sig figs. You're gonna see scientific notation a lot. So you want to be familiar with it. Scientific notation is a shorthand. By the way, if you are taking notes, the way I lecture, take notes on what I'm saying, not what I'm writing. Uh, if you, the only thing you take notes on is my writing, uh, first of all, I can ha I'm going to make a PDF of that. You can text me and ask me for it. Um, but most of what I'm saying is the important stuff. So scientific notation is basically a mathematical shorthand for writing particularly large or particularly small numbers. That's all it really is. One of the most useless things you're going to learn in a chemistry class is Avogadro's number. Avogadro's number is just a number. Doesn't matter what it applies to, it's just a number. A dozen is 12. 12 what? Doesn't matter. It's always 12. If you're talking about a dozen, it's 12. That's it. It's just 12. 12 eggs, a dozen eggs. 12 pieces of bacon, a dozen bacon. Um, $12, a dozen dollars. You can apply it even to money. But if you say dozen, everyone knows 12. And 12 what depends on the content of the discussion. I've got his number. It's just a number. It's the same number no matter what it applies to. Avogadro's number of atoms, Avogadro's number of molecules, Avogadro's number of dollars. I would love to have Avogadro's number of dollars, but there's not enough dollars. Um, Avogadro's number is this. How many is Avogadro's number? How many is one mole? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty, twenty-one, twenty-two, twenty-three. If we're talking about Avogadro's number, we're talking about that many. Would you like to write out that number of zeros every single time you talk about Avogadro's number? Because I don't. This is how many is in one mole. Avogadro's number is the amount that is in one mole. One mole of what? One mole of anything you want. One mole of atoms, one mole of molecules, one mole of money, one mole of planets. This is how many there are in a mole of anything. Avogadro's number. We actually don't use it. You will use it in homework if you try the homework. Uh, the point of using it in homework is to cement in your mind that Avogadro, that a mole is a number. What number? It's Avogadro's number. A mole is a number, just like a dozen is a number. But chemists don't speak in terms of 600 into billion trillion. I think this is a billion trillion. Three, let me see, 100,000 million, billion, 100,000 million. Oh, it's a billion billion. Uh, anyway, it doesn't matter because chemists don't speak in terms of that. They speak in terms of moles. We'd rather have three moles than 18 billion trillion or whatever it is. It's easier to say three moles. It's easier to say a gross than 144 or a dozen dozen. One dozen dozen is 144, 12 by 12. 144. It's easier to say gross than a dozen dozen. It's just easier. Chemists say mole. 
We don't say, you know, this many number. We say we have a mole. And we all understand what that means. So in your homework, you may use Avogadro's number just to cement in your mind. This is a real number. But beyond the Avogadro number questions and homework, you'll never use it again. You'll use moles. But anyway, sometimes we do need to know how many it is. Well, so I just contradicted myself. I'm allowed. <laughs> okay. On occasion, on rare occasion, we do need to know what it is. And you don't want to write the whole number out. So the decimal point is assumed to be here. If there's no decimal point given, the decimal point is always assumed to be after the last digit. And if you count over one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, I did that wrong. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty, twenty-one, twenty-two, twenty-three. It is twenty-three spaces. from the first non-zero number. 23 spaces from the first non-zero number, which means we can rewrite Avogadro's number using scientific notation. We put the decimal point after the first non-zero number, and it's always times 10 raised to the 23rd power. Where 23 come from? 23 came from here. We had to move the decimal point 23 places to put it after the six. So the scientific notation is 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd. So if I have 5.0, well, apparently it's 5.40 times 10 to the third power. How many is that? Well, this three tells us to take the decimal point and move it three spaces to the right. One, two, and notice there's another space. We've gone beyond the number itself. When you go beyond the number, it's always assumed to be zero. So 5.4 times 10 to the third is 5,400. If you're doing calculations, do I have a calculator that you might like? Yes. A lot of students will misuse their calculator and as a result, frequently are off in their calculations by a factor of 10. Because they will take that times 10 to the literally. And if you look on your calculator, a lot of times, where's this button? This one doesn't seem to have it. No, wait a minute. Very hard to see. So you'll see a log button here. And up in blue right there is 10 to the power. And they will literally, you can also use this in Y to the X. So they will literally type in 5.40, by the way, you don't have to put the last zero in there. It will literally type in 5.4. I'm not even going to show it to you. And then they'll hit the times button. And they will put, in this case, it has to be second uh, inverse log to get 10 to the power. And then 4. There's a much easier way to do that. You're making way too much work for yourself. So much easier. 
to put in 5.4 times 10 to the fourth power, is that it? To put 10 to the third power, 5.4 times 10 to the third. So we put in 5.4. And there's always a button in the scientific. I didn't put that twice. Why did that do that? 5.4. It's it's showing up on my screen backwards. So it looks like I'm putting in a two. This I'm actually putting 5.4. There's always an EXP button or an EE button. Actually, this one is weird. This is EEX. But there's always an EXP or an EE button. That EXP literally means times 10 to the power. So to put in 5.4 times 10 to the third, just put in 5.4 EXP3. And it will look, well, if it's not backwards, it would look like this. That is the proper way to put in scientific notation in your calculator. So, in order to put this in my calculator for calculations, I would put in, for example, 6.02 minus EXP 23 or 5.4, if you want 5.40, but like I say, you don't need to put in the last one, EXP4. EXP literally means times 10 to the one button times 10 to the. Any questions? No, because nobody is here. I'm talking to myself like a dink. Okay. Just me and the ghosts. I started off saying that scientific notation is shorthand for very large or very small numbers. How do you do small numbers? Well, what do I have? Suppose I have 2.37 times 10 to the negative 6. Now, when I have a positive number, I move the decimal point to the right. Now I have a negative number. So where do I want to move it? Not to the right. Now I want to move that decimal point to the left. So 2.37. And how many spaces do I move it to the left? Six. So it'll be one. Remember that first non-zero number is always the first one. One, two, three, four, five, six. Didn't give myself enough room. Let's do this again so I have a little more room. One, two, three, four, five, six. So I put the decimal point here. Every space that I skipped over becomes a zero. Notice there are five zeros here. It's always one fewer zero than you actually have up here. So 10 to the negative 6 will give you five zeros after the decimal point. After the decimal point. The reason is because the first move is always over that non-zero num number. God, I hate the hiccups. The first move is always over that first non-zero number. Now, it helps to actually see that decimal point if you put one more zero here, just so the decimal point becomes more visible. So 0 0.008, your scientific notation will always start after a non-zero number. So it becomes 8.0 times 10. Now notice that here we are moving, we have a number smaller than 1. That's the big key. 
instead of remembering direction and all that nonsense, it's smaller than one. So we're going to put a negative here by the power. This number was, was larger than one. So it's a positive power. That's one of the short, one of the problems with, uh, I'm going to try something here. So I'm going to use my mouse pointer. I don't know if you can see my mouse pointer here or not. But anyway, um, 5.40, 5,400 is bigger than one. So we have positive three. Remember, the plus is usually implied if there's no sign. Here, 0 0.008 is less than one. So we have to put a negative there. And how many spaces did we have to move at decimal point to get it after the first non-zero number? One, two, three. 8.0 times 10 to the negative third. That's all scientific notation is. It's just a shorthand notation a shorthand notation for um, particularly large or particularly small numbers. That's all it is. My thing is not plugged in. Why is my computer not plugged in? There, I'll plug it in before I lose power. Okay, scientific notation, that's all it is. Here's a question. Why did I put the zero after the eight? You may have noticed a delay there before I put that zero there. Why didn't I put more zeros? Why did I include the zero here? This comes down to significant figures. Significant figures. Let's talk about what significant figures. First of all, I want you to understand why we need significant figures. Significant figures is used in science to tell people exactly how well we know a number. That zero after the eight, usually you can assume, unless it's otherwise specifically noted, Usually you can assume plus or minus one in that last digit, plus or minus one in the last digit. So for example, ask me how much money I have in the bank. Somebody, anybody. Ugh. I heard somebody ask it. I'm not entirely sure this house isn't haunted. How much money do I have in the bank? 60 bucks. Obviously, I made that number up. I don't have nearly that much money. But if I tell you that I have 60 bucks in the bank, do you assume that I have exactly $60 to the cent, 60.00 dollars? No. You assume that it's around $60. So $60, maybe I have $57. Maybe I have $63. Usually when we're talking about dollars, we round within five, which makes it an exception. Like I say, in scientific uh, in sig figs, we usually assume one. But if I tell you I have $60, you assume it's around $60. It's not exactly $60. It's around $60. And I will write it like this. But suppose by some freak accident, within a dollar, I have exactly $60. So whoever's listening, spirits out there, ask me how much money I have in my bank. Thank you. I have exactly $60. Okay, now I've specified to you, the listener, that I have exactly $60. Is it $60 to the penny? Maybe not, maybe I have $59 and 73 cents. 
but it's exactly, we're going to call that exactly $60. So if I write it down, now I want to tell you I have exactly $60. But look at these two numbers and they look the same. They're telling you the same information. You're going to assume when you read this, it's about $60. But no, it's exactly $60. Now, I can, if I want, explicitly write out the word exactly. Do I want to write that every single time it's exactly 60? That seems like a bother to me. So instead, I want to do this. Here's how I remember this. Did I, in order to tell you I had $60, did I have to put that decimal point there? No. It means the same thing. 60 versus 60 point. It means 60. So as an author, there's a reason that I took the time and effort to put that decimal point there. I'm trying to tell you something. What am I trying to tell you? I'm trying to tell you that to within $1, I have exactly $60. That's what, science, what significant figures are. If I say that I have about $60, you're going to assume plus or minus $10. Because this is the 10 space here. You're going to assume it's within $10 of 60. It's $60. I have exactly $60. I'm going to assume that it is plus or minus $1 if I put that decimal point there. Now, I want you to notice something here. This is zero. Running out of ways to, to denote something. That zero counts. It's important. Don't confuse significant figures with important figures. Because even if it's not significant, it's still important. So if I wrote down the figures, if I left out the figures that are not significant, then I would have written six. You don't think that zero is significant? With $60, I can go and have McDonald's for supper. <laughs> With $6, I'm going hungry. So don't assume that figures that are not significant are not important. With significant figures, all we are telling you is to what degree we know our number. Let's take another example here. How much money do I have now? I still have $60. Okay, I still have $60, but now I'm taking the good time and effort to write out more zeros. We assume that it's the last number that the author writes that is the last significant figure. Now I am telling you that I have $60 to within one penny. I did not have to write those zeros after the decimal one. I'm trying to tell you something. And what I'm trying to tell you is I have $60 to the penny. That's a significant figure. All right. So easiest way to remember sig figs. Do you have to write them? If you do not have to write them, it's a significant figure. This 
four sig figs. In our previous examples, this is two sig figs. Because the zero is significant. So we have the two, we have the zero, two sig figs. Here the zero, important. Why is it so hard to pronounce that T, that first T, an important? We all say important. It's important. That first zero is important, but it is not significant. This is one sig fig. Just the sixth is significant. Non-zero numbers, always significant. When we're talking about sig figs, we're talking about zeros. But I want you to notice something here. Suppose I write this. How much money do I have now? Now I have 60 cents. Okay. This, whoa, what did I do? All right, let's go back to that. Oh, for crying out loud, now I'm locked up. What a terrible time to lock up. Okay. This zero here is significant. Why? Because I did not have to write it. I could have just as easily written 0 0.6. It would have meant the same thing. So that zero is significant. This zero here, while important, is not significant. Not significant. Why? Because I had to write it. I absolutely had to write that zero in order to place the decimal point. That makes it significant. In this example, I have six cents. Neither of those zeros are significant because I needed them. They are important, important to place that zero. They're important for you to know that I'm talking about six cents, not 60 cents, not six dollars. They're important, so they are not significant. Obviously, the non-zero number is significant. Now, there's a lot of math that we can go into here that I will not, because like I say, what I'm trying to do is get you to understand the principles. The rules for dealing with multiplying and dividing, adding, subtracting significant figures are in the book. Are you allowed to ask about them? Of course. I'm just not going to take time and lecture to go over them. So there is importance in knowing how to do this in calculations, but we're not going to worry about that. But I want to make one more point to you. Ask me again how much money I have in my bank account. Thank you. At least it's a friendly ghost. Ah, let's just go with this. Now I'm lying to you, and you know that I'm lying. Every zero after, well, after a non-zero, well, okay, I'm not going to say that. It's weird. But now, remember, we always assume plus or minus one in the last digit. So this implies plus or minus one-tenth of a cent. One-tenth of a cent. Does anybody's bank account have a fractional amount in it? No, that's not how banks work. 
So if I write 60.000, I am saying I have $60 to within one tenth of a cent. Actually, I guess that's not really a lie. But the lie here is I'm saying that I have it to within more digits than I actually know. It is not possible to have three tenths of a cent in a bank account. This is why significant figures are so important because they are telling you how well we know that number. And if we write out more digits than we actually know, we are implying to the reader, we know this to better accuracy, better accuracy than we actually know it. I think next time we're gonna talk about accuracy versus precision. Then we're gonna get into the factor label method that we did not, I'm writing a note to myself, did not get to today. But for now, we're gonna call it a day. I hope that you've learned a little something, something. I would like to thank my ghost for participating today. Um, I probably should be afraid, but what are they gonna do, kill me? Then I become a ghost. Why is that frightening? I don't get it. If there's a ghost, you know there's an afterlife. So until the afterlife uh, or until Tuesday, whichever comes first, I wish you a great day.